Hey friends, you're watching Brainstorm Makers. I'm Henry. And I'm Irene. Today we're going to talk tomatoes. Everything about tomatoes. So every year we try and do a personal assessment in terms of what we've grown. What did we like? What really didn't work? All that sort of thing. But we also get a lot of questions. So I did my homework and I know the answers. <laughs> Have you done all of your homework yet? I think so. Did you do your enamel homework? Uh, only the written stuff. <laughs> I haven't had a chance to go down and, and, and do the... Uh, but we know tomato. How many tomatoes did we plant? We planted 45 tomatoes. That's 45 tomato plants. Yes. How many, how many different varieties do we have? Well, let's see. And not all the homework was done. Seven. <laughs> I just hadn't counted them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Sorry, eight. <clears throat> eight. I, was I have some notes down here about things I'm thinking about for next year. But yeah, uh, eight different types of tomatoes. Now, you've seen us growing tomatoes in the greenhouse recently. Right. We also grew tomatoes outside. Right. And the reason why we do that is because some things do really well outside. We're hedging our bets is what we're doing. <laughs> and, some things, and some things do all right in the greenhouse. And, right. And we've had an interesting experience this year. Well, first of all, I had some older seeds. Gardner's Delight seeds, for instance, were older. Yeah, and they, they germinated like crazy. So I planted twice as many as I needed. And every single one germinated. And twice as many as we needed right. came up. Right. So I wound up with like eight of those when I wanted like four of them. Our, my goal was to have a couple for the greenhouse and a couple, literally like two for the greenhouse and two for the, for the yard. Mm, didn't happen. Wound up with twice as many. And of course we planted them all. Of course, because they, well, I have a hard time throwing away plants. The second kind we grew was Granadero. Now, oh. today. Wednesday. Wednesday. All day. Why is it telling me I have a Zoom class? Because I don't have a Zoom class. I'm going to have to check my alarm set up. Something got screwed up. So we grow a couple of different kinds of tomatoes. Our goals are always to have cherries because we just like to eat those. Henry likes to wander by and to literally eat them. I don't do it as often as he does, but it is really nice to have cherry tomatoes occasionally for a salad. We grow paste tomatoes because we, and it doesn't mean you're making paste. Any kind of sauce is considered a paste tomato. You can make sauce from everything. Any kind of tomato that I'm aware of, you can make sauce from. But we like to specifically grow paste tomatoes because they have less moisture in them, usually less seeds. So the, the sections where you have the seeds and the goo in the middle are smaller. You'll have more meat. And then when you go to boil it down, it takes a lot less time. Then we also like to have some sort of big beef, sort of beef steak, you know, generation sort of thing. Tomatoes. Now, we love to do slicers. I'm a BLT person. Henry's a tomato sandwich person. But Well, I like BLTs too, but the problem is you need the B, and then you need the lettuce, and then you need the tomato. Right now we're out of lettuce. So we have lettuce, but they're this big. We Those are the three goals for us. We It's also nice to have some sort of a smaller tomato, as a fallback position, they can go into sauce, they can be eaten on sandwiches, whatever, in case you don't always have the big, the beef style tomato. So that's the way we divide up our tomatoes. And we were trying to be very objective this year in terms of trying a few new varieties. So let, let me see, we do snacking tomatoes, right. we do slicing tomatoes, right. and then we do saucing tomatoes. Right. We can use any of these tomatoes in the sauce. And that's what I'm doing right now. The Gardener's Delight is producing way more tomatoes than eight people could eat, much less two. Well, there's, there's <laughs> like, four plants and the trusses are full. Right, really well, full. they're actually finally starting to slow down in terms of making new fruit. So they're all ripening at the same time, which is great, except what I'm doing is collecting them. In fact, I accidentally stepped on one this morning again. They fall off during the night sometimes, and if you're not paying attention to the ground when you walk in there, you'll step on I heard crunch and I went, mm. Stepped on another tomato. But I'm collecting those. I'm throwing them into, I'm, I'm checking them, obviously, to make sure they're good. I'm pulling off the uh, 
the stems, stems right? and tossing them right into a freezer bag and going in the freezer. I've got three in the freezer right now, gallon bags. And soon, probably in the next week or so, we'll do another batch of sauce. We experimented a little bit on some things and we didn't on others. So our cherry tomato has been Gardner's Delight for years. We tried a couple of other varieties. They just didn't work here. Yeah, Gardner's Delight has a great tomato flavor. It's got what I call a big tomato flavor. It tastes like a, a big beef or something in terms of the tomato. But it's itty bitty mm. and it has it has a little bit of crunch to it, but it's not really tough and ugh, leathery the way some cherry tomatoes can be. You're making me salivate, Irene. I know, I'm drooling. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> so Gardner's Delight has been with us for quite a number of years now. Would I consider trying a new variety next year? Maybe. We had problems with Gardner's Delight splitting this year, which it doesn't usually do. One of the reasons historically we have grown uh, Gardner's Delight is it, it's described as sugar sweet, crack resistant, and bears until frost. Now that's really true. It will bear fruit and even manage to ripen fruit until it's absolutely frozen solid. So just that little light frost that makes some tomatoes plants flop over and stick their feet in the air, no, this thing will keep trying until there's nothing left for it to try with. So it's great. I would consider trying something, but if I try something, it's going to be a plant. As our paste tomatoes go, this year we grew Granadero and Invincible. Now we had grown Granadero before. It's got a great tomato flavor. In fact, if we don't have larger sized tomatoes for making uh, Caprese salad, which, in case you're not aware, is sliced tomatoes with fresh mozzarella, ol uh, extra virgin olive oil, and balsamic vinegar. Oh, don't forget the most important thing. And the most important thing, fresh basil. We can use the granadero because it's also got that big tomato flavor, but it makes a great paste. Now, our granadero was not quite as productive this year. Uh, there was something funky going on. And I don't really blame it completely on Granadero, but in the long run, it did well. So we'll definitely keep Granadero. And Granadero and, let me think where we got Granadero for. Granadero came from Johnny's. So like seeds, Gardener's Delight is a totally tomatoes variety, but other people may have it too. It's an open pollinated, but I think the only place I found it was Gardner, was uh, totally tomatoes. Invincible, we got from Haas Tools. That was an interesting tomato. It was highly recommended by them last year. And one of the things that always kind of annoys me is you're like, you're trying to stay up with what's going on. And it seems like every year people recommend new tomatoes. Well, I get that because there's like a million different kinds coming out every year. But you always sort of feel like you're a year behind in the, in the generations of stuff. And you well, hate to just jump off a cliff before they've personally trialed it. Yeah, well, you are a year behind. Yeah, at least. And... It sort of annoyed me to this year that they were, they were pimping a different one, but we decided to stay with Invincible anyway, and we were extremely pleased with them. They are a determinant plant, which means they don't take nearly as much space. They Or as much work to maintain them. Right. They didn't sprawl excessively. I mean, I hardly trellis them up at all. I stake them up a little bit, but very little. They were very sturdy plants, and they produced just gobs of fruit until they froze solid. Now that means they were outside. They were outside completely. I, I saved the indeterminates, the ones that are going to grow forever and get leggy and all that kind of stuff for in the greenhouse at this point. We were very, very pleased with the flavor of, Indi of the Invincible and the fruit quantity for the weather and everything else. Because you always have to consider that. You know, a lot of people had rough s summers this year, either because it was too hot, too dry, too wet, to this, to that, we had the heck beat out of us by a couple of... Two big hailstorms. Hail storms. Yeah, now they damaged the Bellarosa worse than the Invincibles because of the direction that it came from. It hit the north side of the bed worse, which is where the Bellarosa was. We were very pleased with it, and I will definitely grow Invincible again next year. I always feel like I'm doing a balancing act between nutrition and water and airflow. Airflow is not as big a problem as it is here, you know, here as it is in some of the places in the south where it tends to be yeah, muggy and stuff like that. We're, we're dry. really, really dry. Typical relative humidity throughout the summer is typically between 8 
and 15% most of the time. Right. Until we get... it's raining. <laughs> and then it's only... 16%? No, no, it, it'll, it, go right, so it goes right up there. But, but yeah. we have a less of a problem with fungus. So that was our paste. Our intermediate-sized ones, the ones that are not the giant ones, we did Bellarosa and Wisconsin 55. Now, Bellarosa we planned on. That's another Haas tool seed. They came highly recommended as a determinant that was a heavy producer. They were a very heavy producer, even after they got, they were determinate, but even after they were badly damaged by hail. Yeah, we were actually debating whether we should we even pull them. Yeah, I mean, we, it actually we, literally killed two of the plants. Yeah, we thought about pulling all of those plants on the north side because they were just beat so badly by the hail. We had hail that was up to three quarters of an inch in diameter. Mm -hmm. We decided to let them go and see how they would do because some determinants in the past we have found never came back from any kind of injury. They would, uh, like, it's, it's, it's kind of like, I am programmed to produce 12 tomatoes, and when I am done with those 12 tomatoes, that's it. And that's not what they did at all. They came back beautifully. They put out new spurs with flowers on them, and they produced. So Bellarosa is a must-keep for us. People ask how we choose our tomatoes. And I'll talk about that as soon as I... As soon as I finish the other varieties here, Wisconsin 55 is one of those happenstance tomatoes. Yeah. How do we come up with Wisconsin 55? <laughs> totally Tomatoes sent me a, 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 a trial pack of it. And, and you had the temerity to actually plant some? Well, I read the description, and the description I will go through when I were talking about varieties and why I choose the ones I do. But I read that description and went, oh, heck yeah, I got to try that. I, yeah, I was really, I was really surprised by that because normally we'll talk about the different ones that we're planning to plant, and we'll talk about the various qualities of each of those plants, mm -hmm. and then we figure out how much space will we afford to use in the outside and in the greenhouse. Right, because we used to grow more beds full of tomatoes than we now grow. We only had two beds this year, and there were years when we grew four. For beefsteak tomatoes, we grew big beef, Amanda orange, Grand Marshal. Yeah, and Grand Marshall. And Grand Marshall was a new one for us this year. Big beef we have grown before. We always have tried to grow some sort of a beefsteak tomato. And I used to grow Beef Master. But I had a lot of trouble with it splitting here. It just, it couldn't tolerate the fluctuations in temperature. Because some years we seesaw a lot in the middle of the summer between very cold nights and hot days which is great for us because we can sleep well, but some of the plants don't like it. And we found Beef Master to be too fussy about that. But Beef Beef is way less susceptible to cracking. The Amanda Orange was a gift from CB's... Uh, CB at CB's Greenhouse and Garden. Right. And we've been growing them for a couple of years. They are more susceptible to blight than most of the other tomatoes we grow. Well, we changed some of that this year by changing where we planted them. Last right. year, we had them closer to our evaporative cooler, so there was a lot more humidity rolling down the green. Right, so we put them at the end so that we knew the, 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 the airflow was going in that direction, so we put them at the end of the row, so if, if they developed anything, it wouldn't be instantly spread to everything else. And it did work pretty well, but the new one that I tried this year was Grand Marshall Hybrid. And I was very pleased with those guys. They are a determinant, which means they're a shorter plant. I don't think they got any, I don't even, not even sure they made it to three feet. But they produced very meaty, beefy tomatoes. Almost no splitting or funk or cat facing or any of that other funky stuff that you frequently get with, uh, with beef style tomatoes. Definitely a, a keep it thing. Going back to why we try the kinds we try. Well, a lot of people are big on OPs. That means open pollinated. That means you can collect the seeds from the tomatoes and grow them again the next year. And we used to grow mostly OPs. We have decided that in our current environment, that may not always be the smartest thing. If we had to grow Say the world shut down and you had to live with what you had. We always have some heritage variety OPs on hand. You could always grow the F1s, which are the crosses, the hybrids. And 
pick what you get out of them. In other words, the first year you grow an F1, you're going to get the variety you want. If you let it go, it will settle into sub-varieties. The Wisconsin 55 is actually a tomato that was developed that way. It was started by the University of Wisconsin, and it's what they call a stable hybrid. In other words, they bred a couple of different kinds of plants together to achieve certain characteristics, and then they kept breeding that until it's stable. So now you could save the Wisconsin 55 seeds, and it's considered to be an open pollinated variety. So the reason we tend to choose our varieties is size, productivity, and disease resistance, and temperature resistance. I was so, just going to say temperature resistance is a big thing for yeah. us, because if you look at our temperature profile over the summer, there's an awful lot of tomato experts that would say, well, you can't grow tomatoes there. Oh, yeah, I, I see that all the time. Well, we're pulling our tomatoes out now because it's up to 95 degrees, and I'm like, only 95 degrees? Awesome. Yes, that's... <laughs> that's great. That means you can go to shirt sleeve instead of long, long shirts. Right. <laughs> so we laugh at that because it's like, I understand that if you live in an area that's damp, that you have a lot of rain and stuff like that. Sometimes that could just, everything gets kind of moldy and funky and everything else. But if we quit throw, growing everything when it got to be 95 degrees. We wouldn't bother putting anything in the ground. We would just have to give up. It's often 95 degrees in the greenhouse. Now we try to keep it down below that and we've our current system is working well enough so that most of the time we can keep it down below that. But it happens. And if everything's going to roll up and blow away when it gets to be 95 degrees, heck, even where I grew up as a kid, which was a much more temperate climate in New England, we occasionally had summers that were just pretty rough and you'd get some days that were over 95. Now there's some other characteristics we look for in a tomato, the resistance to certain kinds of disease. Right. So if you look at some of these hybrids that I have here, you know, resistance, oh, well, there's, there's two things. There's disease, and there's also blossom and rot, which is a, it's not a disease because it's not caused by a pathogen. It's a problem that's caused by the system that's supplying the tomato. It can be caused by too much water. So like when you have, uh, sometimes when the monsoons hit, all of a sudden there's too much water and it can cause splitting and it can cause blossom and rot. There's also irregular watering cycles that can cause blossom end rot. It's also a def calcium deficiency that can cause blossom end rot. And we are very prone to calcium deficiency in our area, despite the fact that our ground is made a half out of a <laughs> limestone. We gotta say goodbye, Irene. We do, we'll be here all day. If you have specific questions about tomatoes, varieties that we've tried before, or what do we think about particular varieties you might be looking at, let us know because we have tried an awful lot. Be sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell because obviously we have lots going on. And a lot to say. Yeah, and I haven't even started reading catalogs yet this year. <laughs> Goodbye, Irene. Yes, so until next time, bye. bye. Keep brainstorming. Because obviously we are. <laughs>